He believes or said that evolution is a fact. Beyond reasonable doubt. Beyond serious doubt. Beyond sane, informed, intelligent doubt. Beyond doubt, evolution is a fact, says Mr. Dawkins. Mr. Dawkins, I'm headed to number three on your study notes. The fact is, evolution is a theory. I'm Terry Knight, the pastor here at New Life Community Church, and I thank you so much for turning us on, tuning us in. I trust, as always, that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the other as we fellowship together here for the next several moments. We're in the process of wrapping up a series that we've been in for several weeks, one we've entitled, Be Careful Without Turning. We've been looking at some current world views, the filters by which people look at the world, in particular with regards to spiritual issues. And we have looked at uh, those who are against the church and anti-church sentiment. We spent some time dealing with the LGBT uh, dilemma and how that impacts the church. And we're going to try to wrap it up here in this uh, two parts by taking a look at real truth, truth or relativism, truth. What do you know about the truth? And does it matter? Is everybody's truth true? Or is there a truth that we need to allow to overshadow and impact our lives? I believe there is a truth, and it's found in the Word of God. Now watch. I know there are a lot of people that say, well, here's the deal. You preachers, one of you says this about the truth, and one of you says that about the truth. We're trying to take a balanced Bible look at this, and that's all I ask of folks, a balanced Bible look. The Word of God really makes sense when you take a balanced Bible look at it. So I trust you'll be challenged by this. I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 1. Actually, our text passage for this particular teaching is John 17, and we'll get there eventually. But I want you to see Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 as well. Let me read that for you. I have something real quick I want to tell you, and then we're going to pray, and we're going to jump into the teaching. Hebrews 2 and 1 says... This, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Wow. Here's what I wanted to tell you about New Life Community Church for over 20 years has been hosting what we refer to as marriage encounter that's taking place the weekend of March 25th, 26th, and 27th. It is a weekend for married couples, and I'm talking about traditional biblical marriage, one man, one woman, those who've come together in holy matrimony. Uh, this is a weekend to give such couples some tools uh, to equip them to have a better marriage. It's a weekend of encouragement, enlightenment, and it's just a whole lot of fun. It's open to anyone and everyone who is a married couple, uh, even couples that may be engaged and you're anticipating coming together in a holy matrimony situation. Uh, we would love to have you. It is a paid event, a cost event, $35 per couple. And uh, I'm telling you, you will eat more than that, I promise you. It begins Friday evening, Saturday, Sunday. If you're interested, if you can contact me by that contact information right there on the bottom of the screen, uh, myself or someone will be uh, more than happy to uh, give you some more pertinent information, let you know some exact times and so on and so forth. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for each one listening in right now. And I pray that by your word, you would help us to know and understand your truth. And I pray you'd help us to apply it to our life by the power of Holy Spirit. We'll thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, you hang on. I'm going to be back here in just a little while. You keep your Bibles handy, and I trust the Lord's going to bless you as we share this teaching.
This series deals with the subject of staying focused. The primary culprit that we've been focusing on in the series is the distraction that's brought about by the differing world views embraced by many of our neighbors, quite often embraced by our family members, and quite often embraced by our work associates. All of those things make for difficulty. Now, get this, and I'm just going to kind of cut to the chase right here. Often, these differing world views are not necessarily embraced by our sworn enemies. Hear me out. Number one on your study notes. Many times, maybe most of the time, the antagonist, for a lack of a better way of saying it, only differs with us on the finer points of the law. It's true. However, one well-known writer reminds us, and I quote, Remember, all error begins with a slight deviation from the truth. Remember, Satan said, did God really say that? They go on to say there is a bewitching power and even a sorcery behind false doctrine. Seducing spirits are behind all false doctrine. More about that in a moment. Listen, beloved, I said to you last week, I'm summarizing just a little bit. If your influencers, whoever they are, if they are not spirit-filled persons, then they are devil-distracted persons. And I said that not to beat anybody up or to be condescending, but to encourage you to keep your guard up. Be on your guard. Let me see your eyeballs, church. Never has there been a time where it's more important for you to keep your spiritual guard up than in this day and age. Never. And you'll understand why as we move along. Going back to uh, the writer, quote, all false doctrine appeals in some way to certain lust in an individual. And I'm going to suggest to you, especially when that thing is displayed by our friends and our neighbors, not necessarily our sworn enemies. These are people we know, people we love. Continuing on, this is one of Satan's greatest ploys. He presents some truth but only to serve as bait that he might project his lie, which will destroy the individual who follows such teaching. The writer reminds us that Satan counterfeits. That's what Satan does. He mimics what God does, and there's slight variations sometimes. So, again, you have to keep your guard up. Please do not lose a handle on this. Now, you know by now that I purpose to deal with this by putting before you some of the prominent worldviews, and I haven't even remotely attempted to exhaust all of the worldviews that are out there. Uh, we've just felt led to bring to you these three that we have, but you know by, by now that uh, we're putting those before you to help you know and understand what is before us. We began with the anti-church sentiment. The last couple of weeks, I introduced to you some foundational thoughts with regards to the LGBT agenda, and hopefully, hopefully, I'm going to conclude this morning with some insights regarding the conquest against, watch this, absolute truth or relativism. Now, hang on to that. We took you to Hebrews chapter uh, 2 last week in verse 1. I want to go back there because it's, it's foundation. We need to pay attention to it. In fact, it says we must pay more careful attention. Hebrews 2 and 1. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard. Why? He tells us why. So that we do not what, church? Drift. You remember that little teaching about that? What am I doing? I'm a-drifting. Oh, yeah, Donna loves it when I dance. Drifting. You understand that there is a difference between this or boogity, 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 and just drifting. You understand that, don't you? 
So Paul is saying that we need to be very careful about the drifting. I talked to you the last couple of weeks, several uh, weeks. In fact, we mention this all the time about the fact that I have a calling and you, whoever you are, whether you're here live and in person or listening by way of live stream or listening sometime later on, you have an obligation to put forth the truth of God's word. Can you just say that right out loud with me? I have an obligation. Look at your neighbor and say it again with some conviction. I have an obligation. As church attendance plummets, not necessarily here, but I'm here to tell you new life could do better. We have some members that don't attend church, and they promise to. But as church attendance plummets, and consequently, as a consequence of that, church volunteerism becomes increasingly less important than the number of folks fulfilling the obligation to put forth the truth will wane. That only makes sense, doesn't it? Perhaps that's why Jesus said this, Luke chapter 10 and verse 2. The harvest is plentiful. How many of you know that's true? Amen. It is. The harvest of lost souls out there, it's plentiful. But the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You understand he's saying, here's what you need to pray about, church. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into his harvest field. Look at verse 3. Go, I am sending Pastor Terry out. Is that what it says? Go, I am sending. Oh, it says you. You. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Boy, that is true, isn't it? They will chew you up and spit you out unless you know how to do spiritual warfare and unless you know greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world and one of you can set a thousand or ten thousand of them to flight. Do not fear, church. We've been given a power to overcome. Amen. Amen. So instead of drifting, speeding that up a little bit for time's sake, Instead of drifting, what do we do? We compassionately, compassionately, but boldly and confidently, we go. Why do we go? We go to confront the sin in people's lives. Why do we do that? So that we can get one up on them? No, we do that so that we can help them identify that sin in their life and hopefully repent of that sin in their life and receive forgiveness of that sin in their life and re be in receipt of not only the born again experience but eternal life in the world to come. That's why we do that. Boy, it just kind of makes you want to go out and knock on some doors right now, doesn't it? Say amen right there. Well, let's zero in on part four. That's a little bit of summary. But let's zero in on these insights regarding absolute truth and relativism. By the way, this will probably be the worst message you ever heard about absolute truth and relativism. But I'm going to take a stab at it anyways. Number two on your study notes, the greatest threat to your solid standing as a fit soldier in God's army of believers is this. It's the wholesale dismantling of the Word of God. The wholesale dismantling of the Word of God. And how? How does that happen? Here's my feeble attempt at helping you understand it. I did just a little bit of research. It didn't take a lot of effort, to be honest with you, but I discovered at least one source indicated that every day in the United States of America, 168,000 Bibles are either sold or given to someone. Think about that. A hundred, in fact, when I, I went back and looked at that, I'm like, this couldn't be right. 
Hey, check this out. Even if the number is greatly exaggerated, you have to know there's a whole gob of Bibles being sold every day or gifted to people, a whole lot of them. I said that to say this to you, New Life Community Church. How many of you have a Bible? I don't want a verbal amen or a hand raised. I just want you to think about that. And how many of you read at least a chapter of it this week? A whole chapter. Listen, if you aren't reading or experiencing some word intake some way or another, you may be more of the problem than you realize. And notice I'm not screaming and foaming at the mouth. I'm just trying to help you understand something here. You know, religious folks... They love to point out to them when sometimes the problem, quite often the problem is within, in here. Now, for those of you that do read, and I know there are a lot of you here that do read and study the Bible. Man, what a great time we had in Berean yesterday. Guys, if you haven't taken advantage of that yet, let me encourage you to. to. I don't know of any other place in the world where 12 or so men, from uh, young men to some of you that just dream about being young, some great grandfathers get together over the Word of God and study the Word of God. Uh, Bereans, wasn't it phenomenal yesterday? Man, that's, that's great. But for those of you that do read and follow the Word of God, be aware that there is a growing number that is attempting to discredit the truth of the Bible. In fact, they argue that there is no absolute truth, including, specifically including, the Bible, that which I refer to as the Word of God because I believe the Bible is the Word of God. My studies have revealed this, and I'm jumping around a little bit. Stick with me. Much of this discrediting or dismantling of the Word stems from these age-old arguments pitting creationism against evolution. Creationism against evolution. Ray Comfort, who is a bit of a, an apologist, wrote a book uh, dealing with this very issue. The book was titled, I love this, You Can Lead an Atheist to the Evidence, But You Can't Make Him Think. <laughs> Great author. You might want to read some of his books. Probably, probably the most celebrated atheist is of all time is no doubt, uh, Richard Dawkins. Don't know if you've ever heard of him or not. You have now. But he believes, he believes or said that evolution is a fact. Beyond reasonable doubt. Beyond serious doubt. Beyond sane, informed, intelligent doubt. Beyond doubt, evolution is a fact, says Mr. Dawkins, well, Mr. Dawkins, and I'm headed to number three on your study notes. The fact is, evolution is a theory. It's a theory. It's even taught that way, the evolution theory. Can you just hear the teacher? Okay, get out your books, class. We're going to study the evolution fact today. No, it's the evolution theory. Mr. Comfort's reply to some of Dawkins' remarks are, and I quote, if we are actual apes, as Mr. Dawkins believes, which he, he said in a, on another occasion, and there's no heaven or hell and the Bible is bogus, then there's no ultimate right or wrong. Whoa, now we're getting down to the nitty-gritty. This is where the grits meets the fork right here. By portraying that there is no such thing as absolute truth, there's no such thing as right or wrong, then the veracity, to use a kind of a 50-cent word, or the accurate, accuracy, the truthfulness of the Word of God can be challenged. Now watch this. This is hot off the press. 
Those dismantlers do not necessarily say forthright that the word of God is wrong. They do not necessarily say that. But what they do is they nitpick. Are you familiar with nitpicking? They nitpick what they do not like or what they do not comprehend and they use that to discredit or dismantle the Word of God, which is actually Satan's oldest trick. I told you I'd talk about that a little bit more later. I just wanted to emphasize that to you. That's what the enemy does. Did God really say? In the eyes of the world, you understand the world. What I mean by that is individuals who are outside the born-again, spirit-filled family of God. That's the world. In the eyes of the world... And our American culture today, their greatest perceived enemies are those that make the boast that the Bible is the Word of God and that it is the truth. That's no wonder. Listen again to John 17, 14. I have given them your word, says Jesus, and the world has hated them. You ever thought about that? The high priestly prayer of Jesus, John 17, and Jesus warned us way back then when he was praying for us that he has given the word to his body, his forever family. And because of that, the world's going to hate us. Can you imagine? Why would the world hate us over that? We're going to see if we can find that out. Listen, beloved, if this, if the word of God, if the Bible is truth, and I believe that it is, and considering its claims about an eternal heaven or an eternal hell, and by the way, it's a package deal. You can't accept that there's one without accepting that there is the other. But if the Bible is true about this, then how foolish are those who reject it? I find myself SMHing over that. Just wanted to show all the youth that I'm still cool. Say amen right there. No, I'm kidding about that. Seriously kidding. Honestly, I was cool before cool was cool. Okay? I invented cool. A lot of people don't know that. I did. I'll never get credit for it, but yeah. Talk to some of my former classmates. Say amen, Donna. Louder, please. Listen. Though we may accept and do accept that the Bible is truth, though we embrace it as truth, its origin is not with us. Its origin is not with me. I want you to understand this and those listening by way of live stream in particular. It's very important you understand this is not my truth. This is not your truth. This is not his truth or her truth. Beloved, my believing doesn't make it the truth. It's the truth that begets my belief. You see, it comes from God. More about that later. Fill in number four with me on your study notes if you would. One of the greatest arguments for the existence of God and the truth of the Bible is the conscience of humankind. One writer said it this way, quote, you can dull it. The conscious and many attempt to do so, but its accusations will never go away. Watch this. I've never been drunk a day in my life. I came close when I got a shot for sun poisoning one time. Don't remember what that was. I got a little buzz off that, but it was prescribed by the doctor. I've never been drunk in my life, but I've been told by people who have pains and they try to dull those pains and they have things they don't want to deal with, so they try to dull that with liquor or whatever the case might be, but they've indicated that at some point in time they come out of that stupor and guess what? The problem is still there. And the majority of time, another one of the reasons why I do not encourage you to get involved in that whole drinking thing, at the end of the day, not only do they have the original problem, but they're broke and they owe somebody and they did something stupid and they don't even remember it. I heard a lot of old me's right there. Every human group has a sense of justice and requires some sort of retribution for crime. You ever thought about that? 
perhaps not crimes they perpetrated, but certainly such crimes as they perceive were perpetrated against them. That's the way the world works. Now, here's a key. I'm jumping around a little bit again, but I have so much to tell you this morning. I'm trying to get it all in. Here's a key question. Does it matter that we have a truth? Does that really matter? Once again, I'll say to you, I believe that it does matter. Here's one reason why. And this, we're really getting down to the simplicity, the fundamentals of this, very practical, orthopraxy, if you please. Without a standard truth, we are doomed to be victims of our own wicked schemes. We only need to look to the ancient Hebrews during the time of Judges to realize how that works out. I think we mentioned this last week, Judges 17, 6. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Beloved, we're going to cut in right there. Let me ask you this. Is it important, is it essential to have a truth? I think that it is. And we only need look as far as we said just moments ago, look as far as the book of Judges and realize that in that day, everybody did what they thought was right in their own eyes. If we do not have a standard of some description that everybody is doing their thing, then soon enough, chaos ensues. What is that one truth? I offer to you, it's the Word of God. And that's not just what I think, not just what I think you should think, Beloved, this is the truth. History points that out. The present day points that out. As uh, biblical prophecies are fulfilled right before our very eyes, it validates that truth as well. I want to be an encouragement to you to read and study and know and understand the Word of God and the truth that it entails and be uh, very prayerful and very careful about uh, living out that truth in your own life, whoever you are. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for your word, your truth, and I pray and ask in Jesus' name that you would help us to know it, to learn it, to know it, uh, to assimilate it into our life, and to live it out day by day. You have a plan, we know. Holy Spirit, I pray you would help us to live out that plan. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Well, beloved, I've got to, I do have to get out of here. I do want to remind you one more time about our Marriage Encounter. Contact information is there on the screen. We would love to see uh, many of you couples come and join us for this great weekend. I am Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church, wishing you a great week. And remember, my friends, Jesus is coming back. Mm -hmm.